tonight. I'm Teresa Martinez and I'm the Executive Director of the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. I'm joining you tonight from Santa Fe, New Mexico, which are the lands of the Hickory, Apache, and the Tewa people. And on behalf of our entire staff and board, I'd like to welcome all of you to our first ever series of town halls. All of our staff and board will be saying hi right now in the chat boxes so you can see everyone who's here. And our goal tonight is to introduce you to our entire team and create opportunities for you to learn more about the work we've been doing over the past year and the, hope, the work we hope to do in 2021, which hopefully will see us all meeting face to face and in person on the trail. But until then, we hope our town halls will help strengthen our connections with you so that we can remain as transparent and open in our work as possible. Many of you know at CDTC, we, we see the trail as a landscape that connects across communities and cultures, and one that builds a vibrant and diverse dedicated community. And as part of this work, we also feel it's very important to take a moment and acknowledge the lands on which the 3,100 miles of the CDT traverses are stolen lands. And it's important for us to recognize that many of the traditional stewards of these places and that have called them home for millennia and still call them home today were persecuted and killed through genocide and forced removal from these places. We honor these people, past, present, and future, as well as the many indigenous peoples who inhabited, held sacred, and stewarded the land along the continental divide. At CDTC, we feel it's very important to acknowledge the tribal communities in the work that we do. And we hope you will join us in, in acknowledging this difficult past so that we can build a future with more understanding and knowledge of the landscapes, communities, and cultures the trail connects and brings together. And if anyone else is interested in sharing where you're joining us from tonight and the ancestral lands that you are on, Andrea is putting the ancestral native lands map in the chat box and you can go to that and search where you're calling in from and add that to the chat box so we can all acknowledge the lands that we're on. And now I'd like to give you a quick overview of the state of the CDTC. And this starts that 2020 was one of the best years we've ever had. And much of that success is due to your ongoing and continued support and involvement in our work. So please accept our deepest gratitude for being a part of CDTC and helping us accomplish so many great things, many of which you'll hear about tonight from our amazing team. One of the highlights we always like to share is how many hours CDTC and all of our partners up and down the trail contributed towards its completion, protection, and stewardship. And without further ado, it's like a drum roll, please. In 2020, collectively and together, we all contributed over 30,000 hours of volunteer labor valued at over $800,000 of, of, of eight, valued at over $800,000. It's pretty amazing, almost a million dollars. And all of this for the small investment of a mere 195,000 federal dollars. That's a nearly four to one match contributed by all of us in support of the trail on behalf of the American public. And that is simply amazing. And for that, for all of you who helped contribute to that, thank you. Also in 2020, CDTC's board formally adopted our new strategic plan. And we just put that in the chat box if you haven't seen it yet. Our strategic plan defines the goals and vision we will use to guide our work over the next few years. And it is the culmination of work we did in 2019, listening to stakeholders, communities, partners, and members like you who shared your thoughts with us. The plan reflects the feedback we heard and directs us to continue our work to embed the principles and practices of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion into all facets of our work. It also helps directs us to focus on remaining resilient and adaptable in a constantly and rapidly changing world as we've all experienced this year. And the plan directs us to center our work in our gateway communities and all of the communities that we serve and directs us to continue to decentralize and regionalize our operations so, so that not only do we remain deeply rooted in our grassroots origins and culture, we can better serve the communities the trail connects. The time we dedicated to putting your thoughts into the plan are for certain one of the reasons we were able to pivot so quickly this past year, as many of you may recall, in the face of COVID and ensured that we were able to remain so productive, stable, and resilient. In June, we released the Atlas of the CDT, which Andrea also just put in the chat if you haven't seen that. It is a groundbreaking result of over three years of GIS work to showcase that there is no better way to ensure a high quality trail experience for visitors to the CDT than by protecting its landscapes, wildlife, watersheds, and their interconnections. The Atlas helps us focus on the resources along the trail and the protection and stewardship. 
And because there's nothing more important than the major watershed of the North American continent, which is the very reason the trail exists, it helps us show that it's kind of a big deal. The Atlas also helps us see that we still have so much work to do, and it helps work toward our vision of the trail as a connector of landscapes, cultures, and communities. And finally, this past August, we are excited to share that we signed an interagency memorandum of understanding with the National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, and U.S. Forest Service, and it recognizes us as a lead national partner in the protection, completion, and stewardship of the CDT. This is a result of our work over the past eight years to strengthen and deepen our relationship with the many stakeholders and communities along the trail, as well as the many agency offices responsible for its overall management and administration. Much of this work has been making sure that many of the voices of those who love the trail are invited to get involved in its stewardship and protection, as well as celebrating those long-standing organizations, many of you which, um, those long-standing organizations, individuals, and communities, many of which are on the, the Zoom tonight, who have shown this commitment for decades. It is a model of a public-private, innovative, and creative partnership that works, and a reflection of our belief that it is in the best interest of the American public to protect this trail. Thank you again for joining us tonight and for making our past so successful. And now, as we look forward, I'm gonna pass it over to Andrea Kurth, our Gateway Community Program Manager, to take it from here. Andrea. Thanks, Teresa, and thanks to everyone who's attending this town hall tonight. We're really happy to see you all here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrea Kurth, and I stepped into the role as CDTC's Gateway Community Program Manager in May 2020. I'm joining from Frisco, Colorado, the lands of the Ute people. And as Teresa mentioned, we at CDTC are very excited to continue to grow in partnership with our designated CDT Gateway communities and really stepped up our commitment to the Gateway Community Program with the creation of my role last year. In 2020, we also hired Francesca Governali, who serves as our Community Engagement Coordinator through AmeriCorps VISTA, and Francesca has added even more capacity for us to support our 18 gateway communities in completing, promoting, and protecting the CDT. In 2020, we celebrated the designation of our two newest CDT gateway communities, Lake City, Colorado, and Helena, Montana. Unfortunately, we weren't able to host designation ceremonies in person. However, we're honored to work with the folks in Lake City, Helena, and in all of our gateway communities to continue to embark on projects that bolster the outdoor recreation economy along the trail and help promote recreation on the CDT to visitors and residents. Last fall, we also hosted our first ever Gateway Community Summit. Uh, though we originally planned on hosting the summit in person, we had to pivot it to five online webinar, webinar style sessions because of the pandemic. We were incredibly grateful to welcome over 50 volunteers to discuss the benefits of the Gateway Community Program and to begin working on projects that will promote the trail and the Gateway communities that it passes through. We really owe the success of the Gateway Community Program to all of our volunteers. So if you're involved in your Gateway Community Advisory Committee, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your dedication and hard work. After it became clear that we wouldn't be able to host our annual Trail Days celebration in Silver City last year, we decided to take Trail Days virtual and hosted a speaker series on Facebook Live. While we were devastated to miss our annual trip to Silver City, we were so excited to share the culture of Silver City and the rest of the CDT with a worldwide audience. Last year, we also continued recruiting residents to serve as Gateway Community Ambassadors. Currently, we have 20 volunteer ambassadors from 10 of our Gateway communities who serve as a resource to their friends, family, and neighbors, teaching them how to access the trail. We're incredibly thankful for all of our Gateway Ambassadors and we're looking forward to supporting in-person events this year. 
while last year we couldn't host any in-person activities, um, we're we are ready to hit the ground running with updated health and safety measures to keep our ambassadors and participants safe while they explore the CDT. Last year, we also updated our business membership program and are now offering marketing materials to all of our generous CDTC business members. And also, thanks to Francesca, we began developing a CDT curriculum that educators along the trail can use to teach about the history, ecosystems, and stewardship of the CDT. Francesca surveyed over 50 educators along the trail to get a sense of what kind of information would be useful for teaching about the CDT. And we even got the chance to implement some CDT lessons teaching over 70 youth about the trail last summer. This year, we hope to use the momentum we gained last year to continue to provide useful resources to our Gateway community residents and business members and to continue to celebrate the trail, although we cannot yet safely celebrate together in person. We will not be planning an in-person Trail Days event until we're sure that it's safe to host large gatherings, but we're thrilled to announce that we'll be taking Trail Days online again this year. Every Thursday from April 22nd to May 13th, we'll be hosting speakers on Facebook Live to share their knowledge of the CDT and the landscapes and ecosystems surrounding the trail. We will be releasing more details about our featured speakers next month, so be sure to tune in in April for our second virtual trail days. Our paramount goal is to keep our volunteers, staff, and Gateway community members safe and healthy, so we have also decided not to operate the CDTC shuttle to Crazy Cook or stock our boot heel water caches until it's safe to do so. You can stay up to date on shuttle and trail closure information at continentaldividetrail.org slash trail dash updates. And Francesca will add that link in the chat box for you to bookmark if you would like to stay up to date with trail information. While we're sad we won't get to see you in person at trail days or on the shuttle, we still do have some ways for you to get involved. So if you live in a CDT Gateway community and would like to serve on your Gateway Community Advisory Committee, we would be happy to have your input. You can email me and we'll make sure you're included in the next committee meeting. We're also always looking for Gateway Community Ambassadors. So if you live in or near a Gateway Community and you're interested in volunteering to introduce folks to the trail, please email me at gateway at continentaldividetrail.org. And if you're a business owner and would like to learn more about our business membership program, you can also email me and I will send you more information. And last but not least, on Wednesday, February 24th, we'll be hosting a virtual training for any folks who want to represent CDTC at events when they're safe again. We'll be sending a follow-up email after tonight with some more information about how to sign up. That's all I have about the Gateway Community Program and welcome your questions at the end of the session. And for now, I will pass it off to Dan Carter, our Trail and Lands Conservation Specialist, to talk about our trail completion efforts. Okay, there we go. Uh, good. Um, thank you, Andrea. Um, welcome, everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces or familiar names, rather, in the, the attendee box over here. Uh, welcome to our town hall. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, again, I'm calling in from Las Cruces, New Mexico, and I am the Trail and Lands Conservation Program Manager. And um, more or less, this program shows you know the CDTC's commitment to completing the trail and protecting the trail um, by creating this program and creating my position, which began in October of 2019, I came on board. And since then, um, my main goal is to, as you can see in the title there, is, is completing the trail, um, mostly starting with the main gap areas. Um, so 96% uh, of the CDT is owned protected lands, um, mostly federal public lands, 
um, that are permanently protected, whereas the remaining, you know, five to six percent, we're still working on um, getting that protected and getting the trail off of roads and other unprotected areas um, to complete the, the full 3,100 miles. And then only 77 percent of that is on non-motorized non routes. A lot of it follows some uh, motorized uh, forest roads or other small roads as well that um, working on closing those gaps as well. So in 2020, in part 2019 and 2020, uh, I worked, some of the highlights were um, convening working groups around some of the major uh, trail gap areas, which as you can see in the map here that comes from our atlas. Um, those main gap areas are in Mangus Valley, um, down near Silver City, New Mexico, uh, Pie Town to Grants area, that currently is a pretty long road walk. If any of y'all have hiked that section, you probably remember it well. Um, and that also includes the El Mapais area and also Mount Taylor uh, section of the trail. And then in Cuba, New Mexico, uh, another gap, which you can see actually some of the results of these efforts in my background. This is a lovely sunset from a completed reroute the Santa Fe National Forest did last year. This is really nice. And then also up in Colorado, the Muddy Pass um, gap near Steamboat Springs um, are the, the main gaps that I've been working on this year. And with that, we convene working groups with stakeholders and uh, so all of our um, federal land um, partners, BLM, Forest Service, state land offices, um, community members, um, private um, businesses, industry, um, to help us figure out a way that's going to work to complete the trail for everyone. Um, so just um, some of our other uh, goals for this year is continuing those working groups and finalizing what we call the optimal location review, which is the process we created with the Forest Service to find that, that optimal location that's going to work for all the stakeholders, all the users of this like amazing landscape along the divide. Um, expanding some working groups as well to include um, areas such as the Cochitopa Hills, um, some of the minor gaps within the states, um, and also, you know, breaking out Pie Town and Mount Taylor areas, and also exploring some minor gaps down like in, such down in the Boot Hill, working with New Mexico State Land Office um, and the BLM to um, improve some infrastructure and, and close those gaps as well. And in the meantime, um, I welcome any questions um, or comments regarding um, some scouting or some ideas for those gaps. And just a per public service announcement in the meantime, please close the gate while you're out on the CDT. So we would all greatly appreciate that. And I will pass it off next to Luke, Luke Fisher, our uh, trail and policy program manager. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited to speak to all of you. Um, I'm Luke Fisher, I'm the trail policy manager uh, at CDTC, I use they them pronouns. Um, and this is actually my third month with CDTC and it has been such a wild ride so far. Um, so kind of going off of what Dan was talking about with the CDTC or CDT completion, um, one of the great achievements that we had this year was the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, so this was a huge piece of legislation that's really a landmark piece and is gonna have impacts for years to come. Um, so since its inception in 1964, um, the Land and Conservation Fund has been an ind indispensable tool to protect public lands and spaces. Um, for example, so just in New Mexico, this CDT is forced to follow along roads in several areas where there's no public land to pass through. Um, so most notably along a 50 mile stretch near Grants. So uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund was able to purchase 5,000 acres of private land in this area. and uh, the trail was able to be moved off the road and hikers were more able to access it and it was a really great improvement. So what the Great American Outdoors Act was actually make sure that we have funding for this land and water, water conservation fund uh, in perpetuity. So every year, uh, the land and Conser water conservation fund will receive $900 million um, of revenues, mostly from offshore oil and gas um, to make sure that public lands can be bought like this, um, so that the trail is able to be completed in a tighter time frame, um, and it removes a lot of the barriers that we had for access to public lands. Um, so what this fund really did, or what the Great American Outdoors Act was not only just fund uh, the 
Land and Water Conservation Fund, but it also provided funds for the backlog and forest maintenance and everything else. So while we absolutely want to purchase these lands, we also want to make sure they're managed well. Um, so we are getting $1.6 billion annually from the federal government uh, for forests across the nation and state parks and local parks as well um, to ensure that maintenance gets done. Um, so with the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, we have money in the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We have money to go towards the backlogs of maintenance and the Forest Service. And it really is a breakdown of the huge barrier the CDT had for the completion of the trail. Um, so it's a lot of celebration to be done just on that this year. And I really wanna thank all the members and community leaders and business leaders um, that helped advocate and helped us move this bill along and also to our uh, champions all along the trail. Um, the next part of our achievements this year was a lot, we did a lot of forest planning. Um, so for people who don't know a lot about forest planning, forest planning happens about every 15 years and they just evaluate the needs of the forest. So it's looking at desired conditions, the goals, the objectives and standards of like things like vegetation management, uh, fish and wildlife habitat, grazing. Um, but it also looks at management areas. So uh, where specific recreation, like if it's motorized access, if it's just hiking and equestrian access. Um, so one of the major uh, forest planning efforts we had was in the Gila National Forest. Um, so in that, they were redoing their entire forest plan as they're supposed to every 15 years. And as part of that forest plan, the CDT's involvement um, is just to make sure that that forest plan uh, abides by the rules and the purposes of the trail as it was laid out in legislation. So some of those primary purposes of the trail would be a continuous and appealing trail route designed for hikers and horsemen, but compatible with other land uses. And another thing would be uh, a continuous route with a great diversity of physical and natural qualities. So when we're looking at these forest plans, what we really wanna look at is the impact to the trail, the trail corridor, the ecosystems all around it and the watersheds. Um, so the Forest Service has a really great and public uh, way for the public to get involved in these decisions. So CDTC tries to take the lead um, for all the impacts that would happen to the CDT trail. But I'd also really encourage anyone who lives in this area um, the Gila is actually going to do their final environmental impact statement later this year. So um, be on the lookout for that and get involved. Um, com anyone can comment from the community. So really get out and get involved and informed um, on that plan as it comes out this year. Um, the other major uh, forest planning we did this year was the Pike and San Isabel management plan, travel management plan. Um, so with that, they were looking at redesignating some roads, some trails, um, and changing up the access. So uh, what we were looking at here for the CDT was to make sure that uh, the trail remained for the purposes that it was made for, right? So mainly hiker and equestrian use. Um, so making sure that if there were bike paths that might intersect with the CDT, making sure that it was just a perpendicular one-time crossing, but there's uh, no ability for them to get on the trail. Um, and then that would obstruct, you know, equestrians if they're riding on the trail, a bike could spook a horse um, or, just like high speeds on those trails, people aren't expecting it. So um, with both these uh, forest planning efforts, we were really trying to make sure that the CDT um, is respected and that all the purposes and needs of the CDT are being met. Um, but once again, with those forest planning, they are a totally public process. There's a really great guide uh, given out by the Forest Service on how to respond to those for citizens. Um, so I highly encourage everyone to look at those. Um, some of our internal policies that we developed this year were the CDT experience, uh, which is a foundational document kind of that will guide all the rest of our policy planning. So in that CDT uh, experience, it really envisions a future for just and equitable um, access to our trail and also reflects on the past and the history of all the cultures and actively engages all people. So we wanna make sure it's a welcoming space for people of all races, ethnicities, backgrounds, and abilities to access the healing powers of nature and connect to something greater than oneself. So we just, the CDT experience uh, goes further into our, the purpose of the trail, what we hope you get out of the trail, what we hope um, we're uh, providing for the community so that everyone can enjoy these equally. Um, another policy that we developed was the linear transmission policy. Um, so this is uh, a policy that is supposed to address things like if a natural ga gas line was uh, to cross over the trail or be in the vicinity of a trail or things like uh, telephone and cable trunk lines, irrigation canals. So uh, with this policy, we recognize that these are important public services, but we wanna make sure they have as little impact up to the trail as possible. And especially in the trail corridor where, you know, scenic value is a big part of it, right? It's a ridge trail. So you can see over lots of 
areas of land. So we just want to make sure with these uh, projects, we're working alongside BLM, Forest Service, Parks, and other parks to make sure that when we have these linear transmission of resources, it has as little impact as possible to the actual trail. We also developed an e-bike policy. So this is kind of uh, in the space of these emerging technologies, right? So e-bikes are being bought and used on trails more and more often. So this uh, CDTC just wanted to make sure there's um, some guidelines when forests are going into this forest planning process to see what is the CDT's uh, e-bike policy process. And so for things like that, just making sure that these are considered motorized bikes. They're not, they are a unique class of vehicle that have a unique uh, impact on the trail. Um, and then lastly, we are currently working on the emergency and incident response uh, policy. So this is a policy that we foresee more people using the trail, which is a really great thing. But as more people use, there might be more incidents, there might be a more uh, emergency. So we're coordinating a policy so that we can better work with search and rescue, forest service, uh, and our gateway communities to make sure that we're uh, reporting those incidents and responding to them as best we can. And so with all those uh, policies, those are, can all be found online. And as we bring out more of those policies, they are open for public comment and we do appreciate feedback on them. So be on the lookout um, and feel free to check those out on the website as well. Um, lastly, for the 2021 policies of interest, um, these are just policies and pieces of legislation that I hope uh, everyone can get a chance to look at and be on the lookout for when uh, we put out press releases and things uh, so that you're more aware of what's going on uh, with uh, this policy space. So one of the first ones we have is the CORE Act, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard from us from. Uh, it is a piece of legislation that almost got passed last year and it, uh, it's going to be reintroduced this year. So this is a piece of legislation that would protect about 400 acres of public lands. So that's uh, four specific places are in the Continental Divide and Camp Hill, the San Juan Mountains, the Thompson Divide and Keebler Pass, and the Curriconti National Recreation Area. So this is designed to bolster those uh, land uh, protections and also help the outdoor economy in these areas that depend on uh, public protections and these lands to um, support their local economies. Um, we have the Outdoor Future Initiative, which is a initiative led by Black, Indigenous, and leaders of color from states and organizations across the country uh, who came together because they saw the need for a national outdoor equity initiative. So this is titled the Outdoor Future Initiative, um, which seeks to ensure increased accessibility to public lands for underserved youth and communities of color. So the plan is to create a program to invest in organizations and states and tribal nations um, that provide underserved youth across the country with meaningful outdoor recreation and educational opportunities. So this isn't necessarily millions and billions of dollars in grants. This are, are those smaller micro grants that can help with transportation and gear and just making sure youth have the opportunity to get out in the outdoors. And then uh, we also have our transit to trails, which is also something meant for greater accessibility. So there is this mobility gap. So in urban, rural and remote areas, is accessing parks is, can still be difficult. If you don't have a car, if you don't have the train system um, to take you to a trailhead, it can be difficult. So this Transit to Trails Act would direct the Department of Transportation to establish a block grant program to provide critically underserved communities with a direct access um, to public lands. So once again, just creating greater accessibility and greater equity in the outdoors. And the last uh, policy that I'll mention is the 30 by 30 initiative, which you'll be hearing a lot more about and uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, so the 30 by 30 initiative focuses on the protections of 30% of land and 30% of water um, around the world, actually. It's an international effort. But what this means for the CDT is um, even small parks, even public parks, state parks are all uh, it considered under this 30 by 30 plan. So when we're talking about land protections, it's not just the big national parks. It is these things that are in smaller New Mexico communities like Silver City and in Colorado communities like Pagosa Springs. And so uh, with this 30 by 30 initiative, what the CDT hopes to do is really connect the initiative to local on the ground groups and uh, on the ground uh, land and water protections um, that are locally important, right? This isn't supposed to be just a federal program. It's supposed to be local. It's supposed to be based on real people and real stories who are actually experiencing the land. Um, so with that, um, I highly encourage everyone to keep up to date uh, with our press releases and newsletter. Um, as we'll get more advocacy information out. 
I really encourage anyone who's looking to get more involved, if you're willing to write a letter to the editor, if you're willing to call into your congressional uh, leaders, um, please feel free to reach out. I'm always looking for more people to advocate on behalf of the trail. Um, and we would really love to get more people involved because we really are trying to create more of a grassroots movement for that equity and access along the trail. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Morgan with our trail program. Thank you, Luke. Um, this is Morgan Anderson, the field programs manager with the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. Um, and also here today is Gabe Ettengoff, the field programs coordinator. Um, and yeah, I just appreciate all of you here today um, catching up on what CDTC has been up to in 2020 and what we're looking for our field season to look like in 2021. Um, so uh, despite a number of hurdles in 2020, and I think we can all name a few, um, we were able to safely and successfully implement our all important and fun field programs. Um, so this means we had over 100 volunteers. Um, some of you are here today. So I appreciate seeing your faces and, or at least your names. Um, um, those 100 volunteers contributed uh, more than 2,700 hours during 11 separate volunteer trail work events, um, which spanned the length of the, the Continental Divide. Um, so outside of our traditional trail work projects, we still had a number of our CDTC adopters get out on the CDT and address maintenance needs on their own. Um, we currently have 260 CDTC adopters tending over 13 hundred miles of trail. Um, and in 2020, they contributed 1900 hours of work. Um, and so with all of those numbers and everything, um, you know, we really wouldn't be where we are today without the hard work, dedication and good humor that we receive from our volunteers and partners year after year. Um, and we were able to have such a successful 2020 because of those individuals and because of the safety protocols that we had in place and developed at the beginning of the year. Um, and so looking forward to 2021, we uh, plan on looking at the season through the same lens as we did in 2020. So you'll see a lot of similar policies and procedures in place to keep folks safe. Um, but to start things off, um, in 2020, we were able to expand our field program staff to include two seasonal field instructors. Um, so these field instructors are able to expand our capacity to successfully implement and lead our volunteer trail work projects and adopter trainings during their six month season. So we had them on board last year and we hope to hire two new individuals this year and uh, the position is open now. So if you know somebody who's interested in getting involved in working for the CDTC, please feel free to check out our website. Um, so looking more towards you know, 2021, we'll be hosting again 11 volunteer trail work projects along the length of the divide in all five states. Um, these projects will vary from front country to back country, basic trail work to strenuous or like advanced trail structure builds. Um, and as I mentioned before, our projects will be following similar COVID-19 safety protocols. Um, some of those look like reducing the participant numbers for our events, um, people providing their own food, uh, wearing face masks, social distancing, the whole gambit really. Um, so those product protocols will be available on our website um, when re registration opens for our events. Um, and we encourage interested volunteers to review them before registering, just so you know what you may have in store. Um, and so looking at 2021, we are also continuing implementing our uh, CDTC adopter program. Um, so in addition to our volunteer trail work projects, we'll be hosting five trainings to continue to build our community-based long-term stewardship of the CDT. Uh, these trainings are two days in length and cover the basics of trail maintenance, including risk assessment, working with land managers, expectations and responsibilities of CDTC adopters, 
and of course, hands-on experience maintaining a, a local trail. Um, so if you would like to find out more about our CDTC adopter program, I'd encourage you to visit um, our website and hopefully uh, I can drop a link in our chat there soon um, to link to where you can find more information about the program. Um, so with, thank you, Gabe. Um, so with looking at 2021, you know, we, we again, we hope to engage a lot of volunteers on our, on our projects. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're so grateful for the continued support of our boots on the ground volunteers. And, and, you know, I also want to extend our warmest gratitude to our partner organizations and land managers who are able to support, collaborate, and cross pollinate through our shared interests. Um, in the next slide, I have listed out just kind of a very brief, okay, maybe these slides didn't work out. <laughs> oh, there we are. <laughs> Thank you, Allie. Um, if you wanted to scroll up to the listed out projects, there you go. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, so here we have just kind of like a brief overview of what is to come in 2021. Um, our website will be updated with more thorough descriptions of like each project and location and the scope of work come the end of February. Um, and we will have registration live for members on February 26th. Um, registration for the general public will open on March 1st. We do that every year and um, Again, the projects listed here vary in type of work and difficulty, and we're still working with our partners and land managers to finalize some of our details for the upcoming field season. Um, but there's no doubt we have a lot of fun work in store for folks interested in getting out into the field. Um, and then I just wanted to give you guys a brief look at where we'll be hosting adopter trainings for 2021. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, the program itself is focused on long-term stewardship of the CDT through community education and grassroots organizing. So we work with land managers to launch this program, typically near gateway communities and other areas of the CDT. Um, individuals and groups who are willing to commit their time to learning about trail maintenance and visit their assigned or chosen segment of the CDT every year um, are encouraged to visit our website to find out more. Um, as you can see here, we have some locations already lined out for 2021. And, you know, I hope that some of you, if you are near any of these towns, will be able to join us um, out on the trail, learning about trail maintenance skills. Um, so with that, and I know I covered a lot, <laughs> and there's certainly more to cover as well. Um, if you'd have any questions or would like to talk one-on-one -on -one with field program staff, um, feel free to reach out to myself or Gabe Ettengoff. Um, and again, we just really thank you for your time and your interest in CDTC's mission and vision. And you know, we hope to see you out on the trail in 2021. And with that, I will pass it to Allie for our Q&A session. Great, thank you. I just wanted to remind everyone that you can still use the Q&A function to get to us and then we'll hopefully take some audio questions at the end. So let's see what questions we have brewing. I'll answer this one. The first question is from Anitra Cass and who are Nitro, one of our favorite people. And she actually happens to work for the Pacific Crest Trail Association. And we love that she's one of our um, favorite people. Um, across the country who supports our work. So thanks, Nitro. Um, but she mentions that MOU is exciting news. It was, it took us a really long time. Um, and she mentioned, because she knows that we had a, we have a CDT program administrator that works for the US Forest Service, who is our prime co um, coordinator. So if we're sort of like the external partner for all of the work that happens on the CDT, we have somebody in the Forest Service based out of Region 2, which is in Golden, Colorado, that works sort of 
on the internal, on the agency side, and we work very closely together. And Brenda Yankoviak is her name, was her name. Um, she got promoted into a position in the Washington office, and she's now the national lead for National Trails Recreation Wilderness in special areas, I think, and she's based, still based in Lakewood, but assigned to the Washington office of the US Forest Service. And we just um, have now a brand new CDT program administrator and her name is Rachel Fanchina, Franchina. And she's also based in Lakewood and um, we work very closely with her and um, small worlds. Rachel and I both went to Virginia Tech um, at the same time and did our master's degree at the same time. So we actually have known each other almost 20 some odd years, which is really, crazy pants, but um, but we're glad that Rachel's there and um, we look forward to, oh, there's Rachel's actually here. Hi, Rachel. And we're very excited to be working with her and also Taylor Willow, who is the GIS lead for the US Forest Service, who works really closely with Lauren Hendricks on our staff, who's the GIS special or program manager for CDTC. And so we're really grateful that we have a strong and continued strong relationship with the US Forest Service, which is no doubt part of our success in getting all the work done. So, and then there's a second question, question from Rick about the strategy for uh, preparing to deal with likely higher uh, fire frequency, size, and intensity. And um, I'll go ahead and take that one too, because it, it does really address in our strategic plan. We have, we have done, and we're going to be doing much more resiliency planning, which is some of that work to think about how we actually respond to things, whether it's fire or other kinds of things, um, lack of water in certain locations along the CDT, I could see being one, um, just changing um, at various different kinds of, of uh, terrain or, or the, the impacts to the landscapes are gonna change as we know, probably due to climate change. And therefore we're definitely anticipating how, um, one, we're preparing for these kinds of huge fire events and how we respond. And that's part of the work that Luke is doing to kind of create an incident response and emergency response protocols internally. So we know how to adapt to them and address them internally on our staff, but also how we can engage or serve as a conduit for the public, especially for long distance hikers, if they're on the trail doing a through hike during some of those events that we can ensure that people remain safe. Um, but then, yeah, we're just anticipating that there are definitely going to be a lot more of these, these events and we're preparing both to make sure people stay safe and then ensuring that we're also ramping up to prepare or to be there and ready for the agencies when we have to go in and, and either repair segments of the CDT, um, deal with, deal with um, some of the pine beetle kill that actually um, create some of the intense fire issues themselves. So we're trying to figure out how we can provide a lot of that support for the agencies um, just because of the very, the, just the reality we know is coming. Um, and I think a couple of years ago, well, actually last year, we all experienced a huge events in Colorado with those massive fires around Cameron Peak and then Southwest Colorado. Um, thankfully, the CDT wasn't terribly impacted, even by the one in Northern, in North Park. We had some smoke, but the trail itself was not terribly impacted. Um, but we are definitely um, working to ensure that we're ready to go and mobilize, whether it's in maintenance or keeping people safe when those things happen. So thanks for the question. One question I'd like to pull up, maybe uh, Gabe and Morgan could be on hand for this one. Uh, David Turner asks, any words about the CDT alternate routes? Will the CDTC be supporting their development, maintenance, signage, and specifically asking about the Gila alternate near Silver City? Yeah, so I can speak to at least our maintenance efforts that we'll be doing this summer. Um, Francesca sent me something else about that blog post actually, so I'll let her speak a little bit more about that alternate route. But yeah, so we will be back in, we were supposed to be back in the Gila again last summer, but that was our project that got canceled because of COVID-19. But we will be back in there working on kind of establishing that route and clearing some of the brush that's in there. And so we'll have two projects. One we'll be doing with Heart of, not Heart, we'll be doing with Backcountry Horsemen and with New Mexico Volunteers for the Outdoors. And then we'll have a second one that'll be kind of in the fall that will be with Heart of the, where we'll be addressing those ongoing maintenance issues as well. Yeah, I can add uh, to what Gabe was alluding to. We have a fantastic volunteer down in New Mexico who wrote a blog post for us about two connector trails that already exist between the river route and the high route in the Gila. 
uh, and we're going to do a better job of promoting those and have worked with gut hook um, guides, thanks to Lauren Hendricks, to get those into the, um, the maps on that app as well to encourage people to use different routes to the Gila if they do take that alternate. And then I'll just share as a general policy that we definitely want to support a lot of these alternate routes where they're on public lands and they definitely help create loop opportunities or connect to communities because we do think that that's important. It's not just the CDT. There's these alternate needs, whether it's because of flood, fire, snow, you name it. There's always going to be a need and opportunity along the divide to remain adaptable and flexible. So we sort of see as embracing some of those routes. Um, I think we're, we're also trying to be responsible in how we do that. For example, the Gila River route, if we have 2,000, 3,000 people walking through the Gila River, that could be definitely impact um, the water quality of the Gila River. And so we're also trying to do that in a way that's responsible and cognizant of our impacts by promoting certain routes. And so, yeah, definitely with like the Middle Fork or some of these other opportunities, it creates just more um, opportunities and alternatives to get through some of these landscapes and experience just how nationally significant and special they are. Um, I think we're all about that and creating a lot of um, alternates and opportunities for people to get out and experience the CDT, whether it's the physical CDT itself or other routes along it. Thank you. We have a question from Katie Hearsub, who says, wondering if you know the extent of trail damage near Grand Lake. I haven't been able to get a definitive answer from local partners. Uh, Jackie, you might be able to answer that, or if anyone else has an idea, please ping in. Um, I haven't heard of anything specifically recently. I know there was a huge um, blowdown from winds and then fires. There was pretty extensive closures um, for a while. I haven't heard anything specifically re recently. Um, I know a few people have tried to reach out and have not really gotten answers. Um, I know with COVID, there's decreased staff in a lot of areas. Um, so I'm hoping to follow up, especially um, before through hiking season starts so that people can be informed. So hoping to get an answer on that soon, um, but don't have a definitive one right now. So I don't know. Morgan, would you like, oh, thank you, Pardon, Jackie. Morgan, would you like to tag in for that one too? Yeah. Um, I have recently checked in with the Sulphur Ranger District, which is based in Grand Lake, Colorado. And due to the fact that the fires um, occurred so late in the season, which, you know, we're learning fire season is just getting longer and longer every year. Um, due to the time that it occurred, they weren't able to get staff out into the field to assess the damage. Um, and so they're waiting for snow to melt so they can get out and actually create a plan for all of the partners and staff to be engaged in restoring that area. Um, another question we have is with the shuttle not running in the immediate near future, how will we approximate how many hikers are on trail this year? That's a great question. And one, one of the wonderful things that we have is a great relationship with the Lordsburg Econo Lodge. And um, we talk to them on a very regular basis about everything, as well as the community of the Chita. And so I foresee that we'll be working with them um, and just staying in touch with them and seeing how things are going. I know last year they reported they had 85 uh, long distance hikers throughout the entire year that stayed with them. And that's definitely a, a both a start and a stop place for people, whether it's um, they come into Lordsburg for northbound hikes, um, get to the border, get back to the Econo Lodge and then kept continue going northward. Or if they come to they, they come south, they hit the Econo Lodge, figure out a ride, get to the Southern Monument and then get back to the Econo Lodge before they hit the train or the bus. So um, I'm sure we'll continue to work with them and understand sort of what the need is and also just support our local communities because as much as we want people to be responsible and we anticipate some people will be out there, we also wanna make sure everyone's staying safe and those businesses are staying safe. So we're trying to balance all of those, those things and we'll be definitely staying in touch with the Econo Lodge and getting the best read we can from folks and also just monitoring Facebook. Um, this the 2020 class of 2020 Facebook group is always a great thing to monitor, which we continue to do. So um, thanks for the question. Another question we had, this is from Shelby Hallmark. I was wondering if Dan could speak this out loud and give everyone a little bit of context. This was the forecast for the solution to the Mangus Valley conundrum. 
<laughs> yeah, thanks for bringing that one up again. Thanks for the question, Shelby. It's great to see you on the on the um, town hall tonight. Um, hopefully, you can see you in person again soon. Um, so yeah, the Mangus Valley is a good example of kind of the work that the working groups have been doing, um, bringing together a lot of stakeholders. And in that one, it's BLM, State Forest, and a private um, company, Freeport McMoran, as everyone in Silver City um, or maybe across the world knows, um, working on a you know together with, to get a find a solution that's going to work kind of for everyone and be again the optimal route in the long term to. To provide that CDT experience for all the users. And so we, over the course of the year, like through um, meetings and on the ground scouting, we looked at three different alignments that could possibly achieve that goal of connecting the Borough Mountains to basically Bear Mountain, Pinos Altos range. And um, just kind of working through all the different nuances and elements of that, um, the group came together and just you know, decided on a route to continue forward with. Um, and again, that's over similar to the uh, some of the past routes, if you're familiar with the project in that LS Mesa, Bear Mountain region. And right now we're sitting with, um, working through some of the, just the environmental planning stages to, and that have to happen to get a trail built, but also working with some of the, the um, private landowners with Freeport McMoran, who has um, given their commitment to completing this project, which is great. Um, that we have such a strong supporter there. I mean, they support other elements of the community in Silver City as well. And so they've committed to helping us work through um, completing this project as well. Um, so it's just kind of building those relationships with a lot of the private landowners, work, figure out what's going to work for everyone, coming to some understandings and strengthening some relationships um, with the, the local ranching community too, and addressing some of the permittee concerns such as gates, fences, um, so on and so forth. So, you know, we can have, so they can, they can all live there in peace and harmony on the CDT together. So uh, essentially that's goal, that's the goal. So um, so that's the, uh, the, the, where we're at now. And, but another big step that we've come in this last year is working on a, um, an easement for uh, New Mexico state trust lands with the, the BLM and the state trust land office, state land office are working on an easement there. And so working on securing that access across state land and that will be for the whole state. So that's a huge, um, a huge movement in, in that regards for the whole trail in New Mexico. And so we're continuing, um, the state land office really become a really strong uh, partner um, in New Mexico uh, working through this, but also with some um, projects down in the boot hill as well. We have another question, which will allow me to introduce Lauren Hendricks, who is our new GIS manager. And this is also something that may be interesting to Francesca as well. Laura Reach, or Wright rather, asks, are there plans to add a geologic map to the CDT Atlas, uh, plus more geology to the program in general from an educational perspective? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the atlas there's a lot of really interesting things that we've thought about um that could be added to both the atlas as well as the interactive map um with uh sly kelly the outgoing gis program manager and me i'm this is my uh third week on the job so um things are still definitely getting figured out but um that's a really great idea um i have a background in uh, earth sciences so that's something that really fits in with my own interests as well um, and I uh, really like that suggestion. So I will add that to the list. Um, I don't know if uh, anybody else has any comments about um, the curriculum that's been developed, if that's in there or would be in the future. Yeah, I think um, I also have a background in earth science, so would love to see that happen as well. But our curriculum right now is very much in the beginning stages. So it's on the list of topics. Um, but has yet to be created. So hopefully it will be sometime soon. All right, I'm gonna go rapid fire because I hope we could fit the last three questions we have in. Uh, our next one comes from Don Parter, who asks, I read the entire recreational pro, oh, I read that the recreational products company Big Agnes in Steamboat Springs did some great work a year or two ago in indexing and in inventoring the entire CDT in Colorado. Uh, any thought of recruiting them to assist again, particularly in the Muddy Pass area? And that might be something that Lauren Murray could speak to as a development lead. 
Sure, yeah, I'm sure Dan also can too, but I actually um, had a meeting with Big Agnes today and shared some of our updates with the Muddy Pass project. They are such an amazing partner of ours in so many ways. Um, we love working with them and they are definitely fully, fully invested in and on board for helping us with um, moving the Muddy Pass project to completion once we're at that point. Uh, and they are also, um, for folks who don't know, Big Agnes is actually a trail adopter. They adopt, I think, 73 miles, Morgan, of trail um, north of Highway 14 up to the Wyoming border. So their entire staff gets out every year. COVID was a little bit different, but they get out every year and help maintain the trail. So um, yeah, they will absolutely be helping out with that project when we're ready for them. Ed Parted. Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I'll second that. I think as soon as we're ready to build trail, Big Agnes will have it built like the next day. That's <laughs> the level of enthusiasm there. All right, I'm picking the next one back to Lauren. This is from Caleb who says, how did 2020 end up being from a fundraising perspective? Did COVID-19 help or hurt the 2021 budgets? Yeah, thanks. Hey, Caleb. Um, that's a great question. And this is something that um, I think Teresa kind of alluded to in her intro about talking about um, how grateful we are for every single person on this call, all of our partners and members. Uh, we actually ended up in an incredibly strong position going into 2021. Um, I cannot express how blown away we are by the level of support of our members and our, and our sponsors and just um, everybody. So I think Stephen could probably answer this as well, but I believe we are in a in maybe the best financial situation we have ever been in at CDTC, um, which is wonderful, especially as our capacity continues to grow and we want to continue to you know um, lift everybody up. But yeah, we're going into 2021 really solid. COVID definitely had some pretty significant negative impacts on us, um, particularly with our shuttle system. Uh, we lost quite a bit of revenue there, events, of course, um, and we actually had quite a few corporate sponsors uh, kind of pull away a little bit from their previous commitments and also a handful of grants rescinded. Um, so fortunately, you know, because we have Stephen as our finance director uh, and Teresa, both of their guidance, we really reined in a lot of our spending last year as we, as necessary, you know, um, just making sure we were only spending what we needed to accomplish all of our goals. But um, but yeah, we're in a really great spot. And again, I just wanted to, I'm glad I got to talk on this because I really just wanted to extend my gratitude to everybody. I cannot thank you all enough for everything each and every one of you does. Um, the CDTC is a wonderful organization because of you. So a huge thanks to everybody. And I think our last question that we can sneak in was from Mary Stuber. This is going to Andrea. Our Gateway Community Group with the Shaba Valley Outdoor Club would like to offer hikes and introduce people to the CDT and hiking. What hurdle is liability coverage for our trip leaders? Is this something the CDTC could help with, perhaps through the ambassador program? Hi, Mary. Good to see your name, and we're glad that you could attend today. Um, right now, all of our ambassadors ask participants to sign waivers. So if those folks are families with kids, then we have the adults sign waivers for their children as well. So um, it's a little bit different of a situation because um, children always have to come accompanied to any CDTC programs. And if I understand correctly, um, you all want to take some kids from the school out, which is great. So uh, we're currently looking for some other options to be able to um, deal with that liability, maybe working with some other schools that we have connections with in New Mexico. So um, I will definitely reach out to you about that, Mary, and we can solve that problem together. Thanks for your question. And I think we are just about out of time, but Teresa, if you'd like to take us home, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Yes, and I will just say that. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I, I, we did, I just, it's, it means so much to us to have all of you here. 
Um, CDTC is a we, it's not a me, it's an us and not an I. And this community is grounded and rooted in, in all of you. And we work um, to serve you and to serve our communities and serve the trail and the landscapes that it traverses. And we never lose sight of that. So thank you for helping make this past year such an incredible success. We definitely, you know, we definitely had to pivot. We definitely had to like think very cautiously and, and, and conservatively but we were also able to maintain a high level of quality programs and get a lot of work done. We just did different work than we expected to do. Um, so thank you so much for attending tonight. Thank you for being here. We can't wait to our next town hall and we look forward to staying in touch and please, please, please follow up with us. Um, you can reach us at info at continentaldividetrail.org and we will make sure whoever the appropriate person is to connect, uh, like con connect with you, we will make sure to forward that on. Um, and just have a wonderful evening. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other and stay healthy. Have a great night.